from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I wish to welcome you all on behalf of uh, the African Middle Eastern Division, uh, our chief, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, and all of my colleagues. I wish you the warmest of welcomes for what will be, I think, a very interesting uh, presentation this afternoon. I'm Chris Murphy. I'm the head of the Near East section in the African Middle Eastern Division. The division is made up of three sections. The African section, whose staff is concerned with the development of the collection from and about Sub-Saharan Africa. The Hebraic section, whose staff is concerned with the uh, collection of Hebraica material and Judaica material worldwide. And the uh, Near East section. The Near East section staff is responsible for building the collection, developing the collection from and about all of the Arab countries, Iran, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Turkey, and the Turkic countries of Central Asia, and the Muslim uh, populations in Western China, Russia, and the Balkans. Or, as I've said a number of times, our uh, purview, the Near East section's purview, stretches from Casablanca in the west to Kashgar in the east, and from Khartoum in the south to Kazan in the north. I mentioned the collection development uh, responsibilities and tasks of the staff of this division. The second and equally important task is to make the collection available. And I'm not meaning in the sense of organizing and processing and cataloging it. Rather, I mean working with scholars uh, from the simplest of interviews, oh, you need this book on this subject, to, oh, you have this research project, now let's consider how this library and this uh, division can help you. And part of our uh, making the collection better known is through outreach. And there are a number of different methodologies of outreach, including symposia this uh, coming August 4th. We have an all-day symposium uh, focusing on the life and works of the uh, Sudanese Arab uh, author uh, Tayyab Saleh. And we also organize these noontime lectures, uh, although this particular lecture and a number of others attached to it are rather special, and I will get to that in a moment. But often these noontime lectures uh, are given by scholars who have been working here in the division on research projects and often have produced a book or a significant article and then they speak about the results of their research conducted here, which again provides a better idea to the general public because we do uh, videotape these lectures of what we do here. Now, today's lecture and uh, my colleague Hirad Dinavari will uh, introduce Dr. Malzoff but I want to say a couple of things just in general about this program. Um, this lecture, as a number of others that have been presented, runs concurrently with um, the 1,000 Years of the Persian Book exhibit that is over on the other side of the building. And if you have not viewed it, I uh, strongly suggest you do. It's a splendid uh, exhibit. Now, Dr. Fatima Keshvars from the Roshan uh, Persian Studies Institute at the University of Maryland was kind enough to work with one of the institute's benefactors, Dr. Uh, uh, Mir Jalali, to find funding to bring scholars who are prominent in the world of Persian language, literature, and cultural studies to present here, and uh, today's presentation is one of those, and I wish to thank Fatima Hanum and the University of Maryland and Dr. Mir Jalali and the Roshan Institute for making this all possible. 
Now, I would like Hirad to come forth and uh, introduce today's lecture. Hirad. Thank you, Chris. Um, I want to thank you all for coming on a very hot day in the middle of the day. I, I appreciate uh, taking time and attending this very important lecture. Most importantly, our guest speaker has flown in from Germany. He's only here for 24 hours and he flies out tomorrow. It's a huge honor for us. And um, of course, anyone who's familiar with um, Iranian uh, printing culture, lithographic culture, knows Dr. Malzah for his great works. Um, I'm going to read a quick uh, biography because I don't want to take too much of his time. Uh, we are looking forward to his presentation. And uh, well, he's given a talk here before, but I'm going to quickly give another uh, overview of his um, distinguished career. Dr. Uh, Ulrich Malzaf is a professor of Islamic studies at the Georg August University in Göttingen, Germany. Uh, and a senior member of the editorial uh, committee of the Encyclopedia of Folk Tales, a research and publishing institu institution uh, at the Academy of Sciences at Göttingen. He specializes in the narrative culture of the Islamic Near and Middle East, with a particular emphasis on Arab and Persian folk uh, narrative, uh, popular literature, and related fields. Among other interests, um, Dr. Malzoff is a pioneer in the study of lithographed books in Iran, narrative illustration in Persian lithographic books. Here it is. We have our copy by Brill. And um, he has also, this was published in 2001. Um, he's also an inter internationally renowned specialist on the Thousand and One Nights, uh, the Arabian Nights. And he has done several works. Um, one of them is the Arabian Nights Encyclopedia with Richard Van Luyen in 2004, the Arabian Nights Reader in 2006, the Arabian Nights uh, Transitional pers pers Perspective 2007, Arabian Nights Bibliography, uh, which is an online thing in 2010. He's also been involved in producing works in Persian um, on the Shahnameh and lithographic works, as well as other uh, lithographic works in Persian that have been reprinted by him. Here is the lovely album on Shahnameh in Persian that was produced in Iran. And um, without taking any further time, I would like to say that it is a huge honor for us to have you here. Thank you very much for flying all the way from over there and coming here and giving us your time. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Herod, for the kind invitation. Uh, thank you, Mary Jane, for having me here a uh, second time in just over a year. Uh, and of course, a big thank you to Fatima Keshavars, who unfortunately could not be here, for making this talk possible by inviting me over. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you all for being here, despite the hot weather. I know it's a challenge to go out walking on the streets. Now, um, today's talk is about printed materials in 19th century Iran, uh, the printing press as an agent of tradition in Iran. Uh, if everything goes well, I should just spare your patience for about 45 to 50 minutes, uh, so there will hopefully be some time for Q&A if you want. The Prince Concert National Memorial in London's Kensington Gardens, which you see here, situated directly to the north of the Royal Albert Hall, has been erected in commemoration of Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, who died of typhoid fever in 1861. Unveiled in 1872, the monument's centrally placed pavilion, built in the Gothic revival style, is surrounded by two sets of four allegorical sculptures each. The sculptures at the four corners of the central area depict Victorian industrial arts and sciences, that is agriculture, commerce, engineering, and manufacturing. And those at the corners of the outer area represent the continents Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Americas thus qualifying the monument to quote Iranian historian Abbas Amanat 
as the ultimate British colonial, colonial representation. Each sculpture representing a corner of the globe includes several ethnographic figures and a large animal. The Asia group here on the far right, designed by John Henry Foley, shows a prostrate elephant that, according to uh, official history, is intended to typify the subjection of brute force to human intelligence. The elephant is surrounded by four human figures representing major ethnic groups of Asia. There's a seated Chinese and a standing Arab to the elephant's right side here on the left, just behind the elephant. An Indian woman with bare breasts seated on the elephant and a Persian to the animal's left side here on the right. Presented as a stereotype, the Persian is depicted in the likeness of Mirza Saleh Shirazi, a character well known in contemporary London as former Iranian ambassador in or shortly before 1823. It is this person that links the Albert Memorial to the topic of my presentation, since Mirza Saleh had already been to England in 1815 to 19 and had then played a major role in the introduction of printing to Iran. The available documentation does not discuss the sculptor's source of inspiration. Meanwhile, the book the Persian man holds in his left hand, and the two books lying on the ground next to his feet might indicate that the sculptor's choice of Mirza Saleh as his model Persian was not totally haphazard. In other words, that the sculptor was perfectly aware of Mirza Saleh's prominent role in the introduction of printing to Iran. Now, it is well known that printing as a permanent cultural practice was introduced to Qajar Iran only during the second decade of the 19th century. Alluding to Elizabeth Eisenstein's highly influential book, The Printing Press as an Agent of Change, published in 1979, the slightly provocative title of my presentation certainly does not intend to subvert Eisenstein's main thesis. Meanwhile, it is well known that Eisenstein's thesis about the social, cultural, and political impact of printing needs to be modified when we look at regions other than early modern Europe. As for the historiography of printing in the Muslim world, Geoffrey Roper has voiced the reluctance of some scholars to follow in Toto Eisenstein's model of print-induced modernity. In the context of the present discussion, we also need to take into consideration that Iran is rarely included in general discussions of the history of printing and publishing in the Muslim world, the vast majority of which focus either on Ottoman Turkey, where Ibrahim Mutefereke, 1674 to 1745, was the first Muslim to run a printing press with movable type, or else on printing in the Arab world, where the printing press was first introduced during Napoleon's Egyptian campaign, 1798 to 1801. I apologize for this image, which is not really linked to printing, but at least it's linked to Napoleon. To make my intention even clearer, there is no doubt that, similar to many other world regions, in the long run, printing affected Iran to the advantage of scientific progress and the dissemination of a growing range of publicly available knowledge. In particular, the publication of newspapers had a considerable effect on the ensuing cultural and political developments. The first Persian language newspaper was Mirza Saleh's short-lived Kharaz-e Akhbar in 1837, and probably the best-known newspaper of the Qajar period is the Ruznameye Vakaye Etefariye, a title that can vaguely be translated as Daily Paper and Current Events, published under various names from 1851 to 1906. I also do not intend to question the fact that the printing of manuals of instruction advanced the dissemination of knowledge, even though knowledge at the newly established Dar al Funun, the Polytechnical College in Tehran, was primarily sought in the art of warfare and related sciences, 
a preference that historically was due to the repeated defeats the Qajars had experienced from the Russian army early in the 19th century. But rather than exploring the well-trodden path to read printing as furthering the dissemination of knowledge and hence advancing scientific and cultural progress, I would here like to explore the extent to which the printing press acted as an agent of tradition in Iran. While this aspect overlaps to a certain extent with the situation in early modern Europe, its long-term effects are still visible in contemporary Iran where tradition, and particularly the interpretation of history along the lines of 12 Shi'i Islam, today plays a major political and cultural role. In exploring the role of the printing press in Qaja, Iran, I suggest to approach the topic from three different angles. After short general introduction into the history of printing in Iran, and an equally short specification of the terminological ambiguities that we need to keep in mind, I will first have a closer look at the content of the incunables printed during Iran's first experimental phase of printing from Mughal type in the years 1817 to 1858. Second, I will discuss the range of books available at the beginning of the second half of the 19th century and the connected problems faced by scholarship aiming at an adequate bibliographical assessment of the output of printing in the Qaja period. And third, I will draw your attention to the fact that printing in Qajar, Iran resulted in more than the printing of books and newspapers. Altogether, my presentation aims to argue that for a considerable period of time after the introduction of printing to Iran, the new technique resulted in the dissemination and solidification of traditional values rather than in the advancement of change. As for the history of printing in Iran, in his History of Printing and Printing Establishments in Iran, 1999, Persian scholar Hossein Mirza Golpoigani has defined four main periods. First, from the introduction of printing 1817 to the Constitutional Revolution, 1906. From the Const Constitutional Revolution to the abdication of Shah Reza Pahlavi in 1941. Then from the enthronement of Muhammad Reza Pahlavi in 1941 to the Islamic Revolution, 1979, and the last period from the revolution to the present day, that is the period of the Islamic Republic. The focus of this schematic periodization on political events implies a direct correlation between political history and technical, cultural, and social developments. Instead of arguing in detail the extent to which such impl implications make sense or do not make sense, I will here have a closer look at the early period of printing in Iran, independent of political developments during the Qajar area, I suggest to split this early period into four phases, each of which is characterized by different preferences of printing techniques, either printing from movable type that is typography or lithography. First, we have the period from the introduction of printing from movable type in 1817 to the introduction of lithography in 1833. Then we have the period from the introduction of lithography to the end of the first period of typography, 1858. The third period ranges from 1858 to 74, uh, where exclusively lithography was practiced in Iran, and a fourth period ranges from the reintroduction and establishment of typography in 1874 to the end of lithography, which occurred about the middle of the 20th century. For each of these periods, I would like to mention just a few contextual details. The history of printing in Iran begins, as I have already mentioned, with the decision of reformist Crown Prince Abbas Mirza to send a number of junior civil servants to Europe on technological missions. In 1815, Mirza Saleh arrived in England, originally with the aspiration to study at Oxford University. When that plan did not materialize, 
He apprenticed himself to the oriental language printer, typesetter, and typecaster Richard Watts, and in 1819 returned to Iran together with a simple printing press, most probably a Stanhope press, which you see here on the right side. Due to the recent introduction of steam-powered presses in London in that period, Stanhope presses had flooded the market and were available at what we might consider a reasonable price. Meanwhile, another student, Mirza Zainal Abedin, had been sent to St. Petersburg to learn the art of printing. Mirza Zain al Abedin had returned to Iran sooner than Mirza Saleh, also with the full equipment for printing from movable type. In 1817, Mirza Zain al Abedin published the first Persian book ever printed in Iran, a book called Risaliye Jihadiye, containing a collection of fatwas that had been issued during the Russo Iranian War, 1804 to 1813. American Islamicist Niall Green has noted that the fonts used for printing this item are closely similar to those used for the Persian New Testament, printed in 1815 by the Russian Bible Society in St. Petersburg, a society founded by British Evangelicans. And as a matter of fact, the link between uh, evangelical movements and the introduction of printing to Iran is fascinating. There's a lot more to say about that, which I have to skip here. Uh, supporting the war against the infidel Russians as a religious duty, the fatwas had been collected by order of Mirza Abbas since 1808. The contemporary importance of this first ever printed publication in Iran is highlighted by the fact that a second edition was published just a year later, constituting the second printed book in Iran. The second phase of printing in Iran is ushered in with the publication of the first lithograph book, a Quran published in 1833. This Quran had for a long time only been known from citations in secondary literature, and a single copy has only recently come to light and is now preserved in the Parliament Library in Tehran. So this is extremely rare. The second phase of the early history of printing in Iran includes a number of important events in the history of printing such as the publication of the first Persian language newspaper, the Karaza Akbar, published by Mirza Saleh. The first lithographed item containing illustrations is the 1843 edition of Maktabi's Leili ve Majnun. This book was soon followed by a large number of illustrated lithograph books, and a highlight of this genre is a book I always like to show, the 1848 edition of Nizami's Khamse that is particularly famed for Mirza Ali Quli Khoui's detailed and lively illustration of the process of lithographic printing. And just to give you a vague idea of what you're seeing here, you have to read the picture from bottom right and then follow on the margin to the top and then turn to the middle. Down at bottom right, you see a guy who's obviously active distilling the acid that is necessary for preparing the stone. Uh, used for printing. On the left side, you see a guy grounding uh, the material for uh, preparing the ink. Uh, then you have various stages of preparing the stone, like smoothing the edges or polishing the stone. And finally, you have a servant carrying the stone up to the studio, where the chief of the studio uh, uh, is smoking his hookah, uh, while one of his... Uh, employees is uh, working to prepare a book. And of course, uh, in the lower half uh, of the middle, you see this beautiful image of the printing press, very, very detailed and very faithful to the actual uh, depiction of what a printing press, a lithographic printing press in those days looked like. The year 1851 witnessed the establishment of the Dar al Funun the Tehran Polytechnical College that was to publish a number of important manuals of instruction, as already mentioned, above all in the art, in the modern art of warfare. All the books published at the Dar al were printed by lithography. The second phase of printing in Iran peters out with editions of the popular martyrological work Tufan al-Bokar, The Deluge of Tears, 
printed from movable type in 1856, 57, and 58. After that, in the third phase of printing in Iran, we so far do not know of a single book printed from movable type for about 15 years. This is a page of Tufan al bokar And the fourth and final phase then begins with the 1874 publication of Nasreddin Shah's travelogue to Europe. Notably, this book was printed in Istanbul with a set of movable type different from the ones previously used. Now, this condensed survey of the early history of printing in Iran may serve to discuss various issues. For the present purpose, I'm particularly interested in two points. The first of these points is the ambiguous meaning of the term printing press in the Iranian context. As we've seen, printing was first introduced to Iran as printing from movable type. The period of incunables in Iran lasted for a well-defined period of 42 years, 1817 to 1858, and resulted in the publication of a total of about 60 items. Since many of these items have only come to light in recent years, our knowledge about the actual amount of books printed from movable type is bound to increase as research proceeds. But even so, it appears that the amount of books printed from movable type was modest, at best, averaging two books per year. For a number of sociocultural reasons, books printed from movable type were soon outnumbered and in fact ousted by lithographed books. The art of lithography invented by Alois Zeynefelder at the end of the 18th century and introduced to Iran by way of Russia, essentially made it possible to produce multiple copies of items written by hand thus in technical terms permitting the continuation of traditional practices of manuscript production. So in the Iranian context, the term printing press has two specific meanings. Moreover, the two different ways of printing did not only differ in terms of technique, they also implied a different range of production, both as for the amount of books produced and in terms of their content. The limited and clearly defined amount of Iranian incunables enables us to assess these books in terms of content. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of Iranian incunables have what I call a distinct Shi'i slant. Out of five works with a, uh, without a distinct Shi'i tendency, three items pertain to the range of classical literature, that is, the works of classical poet Sa'adi, the Golestan and the Bustan. One item is a work of history, namely Abdul Razak Maftun Domboli's Ma'asir Sultaniyye, a contemporary work about Kaja history. And the final item is a work of modern medicine, that is a Risale, teaching the practice of smallpox vaccination, the Risale Ye Ta'alim Namiye Abele Kubi. All other incunables are concerned with Shi'i religion in one way or another. The first book ever printed in Iran, the already mentioned Risaliye Jihadiye, is a collection of fatwas supporting the war against the infidel Russians as a religious duty. The Quran was printed from movable type at least nine times. A particularly interesting item is the Risaliye Husniye, a work whose title has most often been vocalized erroneously. Uh, though temptingly, I should say, as either Risaliye Hassaniye or even Risaliye Hosseiniye, a book that was printed four times. This work, whose uh, original compilation probably goes back to the 16th century, is a Shi'i version of a tale about a learned dispute between an educated woman and the religious and legal authorities in the days of Caliph Harun al Rashid. Probably the best known version of this tale is the one of Tawaddut in the uh, Thousand and One Nights. Although the tale of Husniye is presented as being translated from the Arabic, this feature is probably just a literary device, a trope, intended to claim authority. Recent research suggests that this tale of Husniye was compiled even prior to the tale of Tawaddut thus supporting the assumption that the latter constitutes a Sunni response to Shi'i propaganda. Theological, philosophical, and ethical works, ethical works by 17th century uh, Shi'i scholar 
Muhammad Bakir al Majlisi, who still today is regarded as one of the most powerful and influential Shi'i ulama, accounts for a substantial Persian, uh, portion of the Persian incunables, altogether 12 items, as do similar works by other less prominent Shi'i scholars. By far, the most often printed works was Johari's Tufan al Boko, a contemporary work about early Shi'i history and the martyrdom of Hussein at Karbala. Compiled by Mirza Ibrahim ibn Muhammad Bakha Johari, we know today some 13 editions of this work printed from movable type in a period of 17 years. Beginning with the edition uh, of 1851, this work also contained a standard set of illustrations. Now, if we aim to evaluate these findings in the light of Eisenstein's model of print-induced modernity, we find that the only item truly introducing new knowledge to Iran was the Rezaliye of Kobi, teaching the practice of smallpox vaccination. Other than that, the art of printing from movable type in the Contra period was consciously employed for purposes of political and or religious propaganda, thus solidifying and elaborating the position of the Shi'i ulama, in particular that of 16th century prominent authority Muhammad Bakr Majlisi. Following folklorist Dorothy Noyes in defining three main orientations of the keyword tradition, that is, tradition as a communicative transaction, tradition as a temporal ideology, and tradition as communal property, we appear to be perfectly well entitled to conclude that rather than acting as an agent of change, printing for movable type in Iran acted as an agent of tradition, in particular, a traditional interpretation of religious, moral, and ethical values as presented by commonly accepted historical authorities of 12 Shi'i Islam. Of course, we should not forget that the printing presses in Iran were run by specific individuals that in turn enjoyed sponsorship from high officials. Since printing from movable type involved costly equipment, private printing establishments did not exist. The most productive printing press, the one in Tehran, was run by Mirza Zain al-Abedin and his successors and owned by the influential court official Manuchir Khan Gorji, known as Muhammad al-Dawle, a Georgian eunuch of great political talent. Referring to his honorific title, Muhammad al-Dawle, the books produced in his printing establishment are known as Chape Muhammadi, the so-called Muhammad imprints. The establishment he sponsored was operative for uh, almost four decades and produced more than 40 items, that is roughly two thirds of the total output of Iranian incunables. As Manocher Khan Motamed Dole was one of the most powerful persons of his day, his efforts of sustaining Shi'i religion and ethics by way of printing were certainly coordinated with both political and religious authority. Meanwhile, and this brings me to my second point, in evaluating the historical survey, printing from movable type was only a minor phenomenon during the early phase of printing in Iran. Much more important in terms of numbers was uh, lithographic printing. While Mirza Zainal Abedin had brought a first lithographic printing press to Iran from St. Petersburg as early as 1824, the, pers the first published item we know about is the 1833 Quran. Lithography was then practiced parallel to printing from movable type until 1858, and it was the sole existing printing technique until 1874. Even after the reintroduction and successful permanent establishment of printing from movable type, lithography remained predominant for quite some time. For instance, the incomplete yet proportionally representative holdings of the Tehran National Library in 1999 comprised four works printed from movable type for the first two decades until 1893, that is after the 
reintroduction of uh, typography in Iran. Sixteen items in, 16 items in the pre period between 1893 and 1903, and 56 typographic items by 1912. As printing from mobile type gradually increased, lithography steadily decreased until the last lithographic workshops finally shut down during the 1950s. Now, aiming to assess the range and content of lithographic production in Iran, we encounter severe problems. And here I have a section in my talk which is more or less directly addressed to what I might call the hardcore librarians. Uh, so some essential information that you might want to know. Well, we, we all know that first and foremost, the bibliographical assessment of print production in Qajar Iran is totally inadequate. Traditional sources of information, such as Khan Baba Moshar's Fereste Kitab Hai Farsi, that is the catalog of Persian printed books, or Agha Bozorg at Tehrani's Adhari'a ila Tasanif as Shia, a guide to Shi'i compilations. These books relied heavily on the limited information supplied by the respective author's friends and colleagues, often relating to the holdings of their personal libraries. A comprehensive catalog of Persian books printed in the Qajar period does not exist, and to tell the truth, will not be possible before the holdings of major libraries in Iran will have been catalogued in detail. Already back in 1975, Russian bibliographer Olympiada Pavlovna Sheklova had been the first to publish a catalog of Persian lithograph books in the library of the Leningrad branch of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. This was followed by detailed histories of lithographic printing in Iran in 1979 and India 2001, and again catalogs of the respective holdings in the Leningrad Gorky University and the Russian National Library. Meanwhile, both in Iran and in the West, bibliographers continue to focus on the assessment of manuscript collections. The extent to which this preference is motivated by a certain disdain of early printed books and the perceived minor value against the uniqueness of manuscripts remains to be explored. In particular, the bibliographical assessment of lithograph books might have suffered from the fact that they were regarded as a kind of chimera, neither fish nor fowl. At best, Persian lithograph books were catalogued together with other Persian books, regardless of the date of publication or the technique of printing. At any rate, there is so far not a single catalog specializing in Persian lithograph books in a Western library. In Iran, and this is the list I just wanted to show you uh, for your own profit, uh, in Iran, the growing awareness for the particular historical importance of lithograph books resulted in the compilation of a first catalog in 1992, which is the catalog of lithograph books in the Institute of Cultural Documents of the Islamic Revolution. Since then, Iranian bibliographers have published almost 20 catalogs of lithographed or otherwise old printed books in public and private libraries in Iran, and the holdings of several large libraries are currently being catalogued. In addition to two general surveys of the history of printing in Iran by Shala Babazadeh and Hossein Mirza Golpoigani, both published in 1999, and the Persian translation of Sheglova's original Russian publication about the history of lithography in Iran in 2011, um, sorry, in 2009, two Iranian publications explore the history of printing in the provincial cities of Esfahan and Shiraz, both published in 2011. Moreover, the field already prides itself of a first bibliography of related studies compiled by Ali Buzari and Mohammad Azadi, 2011, and a listing a total of 676 items. Special mention must here also be made uh, of the bibliographical efforts of Pakistani scholar Arif Noshahi, who published a catalog of lithographed and otherwise rare Persian books in the Ganj Bakhsh Library in Islamabad, 1986, and recently a four-volume bibliography of Persian books printed in the Indian subcontinent between 1871 and 2007. That's published in uh, 2012. 
a recent and very important initiative in the field of assessing Persian lithograph books is the Iranian website Bayaz, run by Majid Ghulami Jalise. Since its installment in 2006, the initiative has so far resulted in the photographic documentation and cataloging of more than 30,000 lithographed items preserved in various Iranian libraries. The website is continually updated with hundreds of new items every month and is eventually expected to result in the publication of what uh, Jalisa modestly calls a comprehensive hand list of Persian lithograph books. <coughs> While these ex existing publications and ventures are important cornerstones for a future adequate assessment of Persian lithograph books, the active cooperation of Western librarians and bibliographers is essential to the project's ultimate success. In Iran, books were read and used, often to the extent of literary falling apart and consequently being discarded. In this way, many early Persian books are only preserved in Western libraries, such as to name only the four most important ones, very large collections uh, in the library of the St. Petersburg branch of the Oriel Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences, the British Library in London, the Library of the Paris Institut National des Langues et Civilisations Orientales, and the Staatsbibliothek Preussischer Kulturbesitz in Berlin. As far as the relative value of lithograph books is concerned, I have repeatedly voiced my conviction that Persian lithograph books must be treated with the same respect and care as manuscripts. Due to the fragile nature of the stones used for printing during the early period, every lithograph Persian book is potentially unique. Moreover, although these books were produced in hundreds of copies in the middle of the 19th century, today many items might only be preserved in a fragmentary state in some as yet unknown private library, and even the most frequently preserved items, such as editions of Ferdowsi Shahnameh, exist in no more than a dozen publicly available copies scattered in libraries around the world. <clears throat> but what exactly are the implications of treating Persian lithograph books with the same care as manuscripts? First and foremost, Persian lithograph books need to be perceived as a distinct category of printed items resulting in their being stacked and catalogued separately from other printed items. And I'm very happy to note that this is happening at the Library of Congress right now. In the past decade, most of the large libraries in Iran have begin, begun to put this agenda into practice. Second, the bibliographical data supplied for these books must be much more detailed. At present, even many of the recent catalogs compiled in Iran, where supposedly this work could easily be done, supply little more information than, say, the name of the author, the title of the book, and the place and date of publication. If we were to catalog Persian lithograph books in view of an adequate assessment that will enable future scholars to reconstruct the history of printing in Iran in detail, the data sheets need to take into account many more details than previously. I apologize, this is very small, uh, the, the writing you can barely read, but here I remain assured you have the PowerPoint here so you can make use of that. Hmm? This is a data sheet compiled by Iranian bibliographer Akram Masoudi, and similar um, data sheets have been prepared more recently by Iranian scholars Ali Bouzari and Ali Mashari Rafi. Uh, in pointing out or mentioning only some of the most important data from this data sheet, we find, for instance, slots to mention the names of the printing or print, uh, printer or printing establishment, the book's sponsor or editor, which is very important for lithograph books, the calligrapher, and of course, is the book if the book has illustrated the names of the artists involved. Codicological information on the script and its layout, on the paper and its quality, including watermarks and seals, and of course on the binding would equally underline the unique character of each and every Persian lithograph book. As the presently available catalogs of the major libraries in Iran 
or outside of Iran rarely contain this detailed information, the validity of a general assessment of Persian lithograph books in the early phases of printing in Iran, that is the period 1833 to 1874, is bound to be limited. Instead, I would here like to highlight a contemporary native assessment that is a unique catalog of books available in 19th century Iran. This catalog, whose relevance for the study of popular literature in Quran, in, in Kaja, Iran, <coughs> I have discussed elsewhere, is appended to the 1865 edition of a book called the Kitab Ganjine, a collection of writings by a minor author of the period. The book's publisher, a certain Haji Musa Taja Tehrani, is also unknown, uh, but following a lament on the rudimentary character of knowledge about printed books in Iran, the editor Haji Musa presents what you see here, a three-page catalog of books available in Iran in 1865. And this is really quite a unique document. Incomplete as the catalog may be, it is revealing as for the nature and scope of Persian books some 50 years after the introduction of printing to Iran. Not being able to go into much detail here, let me just mention that the catalog is heavily dominated by the traditional fields of the Islamic sciences, such as fiqh, law, usul, the dogmatics, kalam, theology, tafsir, and hadith, most of which you see here on the right side. Kutub kutub tafsir, and that. Categories of a more secular nature, such as history or language or sciences, such as medicine and pharmacy, are listed. But even these are dominated by traditional items, such as in the field of history, Mir Khan's 15th century Rosa to Safa, uh, the Garden of Purity, or Khan Demir's 16th century Habib Osiyar, the friend of biographies. While a special section of the catalog is Devoted to the traditional field of the interpretation of dreams, Ta'abir e Khab, most of the manuals of instruction printed at the Darul Funun, some 20 years before the catalog's compilation, are not even listed, which probably means that these books were not available anymore. The few non traditional items one is able to identify relate to history, such as the Persian translation of Voltaire's History of Peter the Great, not exactly a modern book or to medicine, such as the book el Tashri, also known as Tashrih Bashar, the first modern manual detailing the physical char characteristics of the human body, ailments, and the medical properties of plants that had been compiled at the order of the Qajar monarch Nasiruddin Shah. And I understand this book is in the exhibition. In general, Haji Musa's catalog documents that at the beginning of the second half of the 19th century, it was still a long way to go until the art of printing would result in the introduction and dissemination of modern knowledge in Iran. Now to come to my third and final point, and here I'm referring to uh, Roger Chartier's many uses and plural appropriations of printing, let me draw your attention to the fact that printing in Kaja Iran resulted in more than the printing of books and newspapers. It is here that our present knowledge is even more limited than in any of the previously mentioned areas, since physical evidence of the single leaf prints produced in the Qajar period is extremely rare. We may presume that these single leaves included announcements of all kinds of personal or public matters, but since, since these prints constituted items of an everyday character, they have, as a rule, not been collected and are rarely preserved. Charms and talismans appear to have been particularly popular. Some of them, such as this one, dominated by writing, often including verses from the Quran. The only image you have here is on top, where you see uh, Ali, the person venerated particularly by Shi'i Islam, together with his two sons, Hassan and Hussein. 
um, again, uh, the same uh, character, Ali, centrally placed in the middle. Uh, and uh, this is a charm uh, playing on uh, a famous uh, hadith, that is a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, um, actually uh, address, addressing Ali's competence, where he says, Ana Madinatul Ilm wa Ali Babuha, very, very famous. Um, well, more or less expressing Ali's competence as a gateway to knowledge. Um, this is just uh, uh, another charm, including magic squares, or another one, uh, again, including Ali and his famous sword, uh, Zul Fahar. Um, and again, Ali, this time, in the form as a lion, an animal that is often rep uh, representing Ali. Other ephemeral lithographed items from the Qajar period include single leaf imprints of scenes from the Battle of Kerbala, which were probably distributed as places of worship, or a highly fascinating item that I just found recently, a decorative piece um, playing on the Quranic verse, Nasrun min Allah wa Fatun Qarib, executed in a very particular calligraphic style in Persian known as Gulzar, in which the letters are filled with tiny images. Also extremely rare, but fascinatingly beautiful, a composition featuring Majnun's beloved Layli, seated on what is known as a composite camel, a camel made out of various animals and um, um, human characters. Particularly fascinating items include a genealogy of the Imams of the 12 Shia up to the Sahib Zaman as descending in a direct line from Adam that was printed both separately and as an appendix to the Quran in 1893. Um, now, this alone would take me two hours at least uh, to go into detail. Uh, but uh, you, you might be able to identify up in the, in the middle band, on the upper left corner, you have the name Adam, uh, as right on the, on the far left. And down in the middle band, on the lower right corner, you have the words Sahib Zaman. And this is really a direct genealogy linking the Sahib Zaman to Adam. So no break, uh, no intermittent characters, but simply... Well, every single character is named. And of course, we have the uh, recently discovered scroll visualizing the Shia pilgrimage to Mecca and the pilgrims return to Iran by way of places of Shia worship in Iraq and Iran uh, that I uh, had the privilege to talk about uh, at the Library of Congress last year. And this journey finally ends and culminates in the visit to the sanctuary of the eight Shia Imam Imam Reza in Ashad. The traditional items of this particular item are striking. On the one hand, it is preceded by historical documents, such as the manuscript scroll acquired by German explorer in the service of the Danish king, Karsten Niebuhr. Uh, and this scroll was uh, acquired at the sanctuary of Hussein in Kerbala in 1765. So this is a mid 18th century item. And on the other, the lithograph scroll is succeeded by items such as this one, a late Kaja period Hajj certificate with a specific Shi'i dimension, or even more mid-20th century items such as the colorful posters that were offered to pilgrims for sale as personal mementos or tokens of their physical as well as spiritual journey. Now, to come to my conclusion, I would like to sum up my main argument by adding just a few general considerations. Eisenstein and her partisans are certainly right in that the invention of the printing press was a major achievement that eventually served the advan advancement of knowledge and thus change. In other words, in order to do justice to the introduction of printing to Iran, we need to consider, uh, no, sorry, um, but the printing press did not have an agency of its own, since it had to be put to use. In other words, in order to do justice to the introduction of printing to Iran, we need to consider sponsors as well as potential audiences in Qajar Iran, 
both of whom were different from early modern Europe. In Iran, modern ways of printing had been known at least since Safavid Shah Abbas had witnessed the Armenians in Isfahan printing their books from Mughal type. But the equipment that was offered to Shah Abbas for printing Persian text was never used. Iran needed the reformist characters of the Qajar period, such as Mirza Abbas and Amir Kabir, for the printing press to make a lasting appearance. And even then, the introduction of printing did itself did not induce modernity. Reformers made use of the technical progress to further their own ends. Whether the printing press served as an agent of change or anything else depended on the local patterns of intellectual production and authority, as well as on the social, cultural, and political circumstances of the day. And yet again, Eisenstein's emphasis on change and my focus on tradition are probably just two sides of the same coin that are neither necessarily antithetic nor mutually exclusive. The present Islamic Republic of Iran offers a multitude of examples for the fact that modern means of communication can be put to the service of tradition, in particularly the religious tradition of 12 Shi'i Islam. For instance, at the recent International Book Fair in Tehran, dozens of popular books on the interpretation of dreams were offered, typically a very, very traditional topic. These books were offered side by side with the sources of traditional Shi'i knowledge, some of them on, well, modern media of communication, such as CD-ROM or even as databases. In modern Iran, political guidance determines many of the ways in which change and tradition are negotiated. While modern technological means of communication are highly valued, their use is particularly favored within the framework of tradition as defined by political guidelines. Moreover, and this is probably a truism, we need to remind ourselves that change does not necessarily imply improvement, nor are the effects of change immediately visible. In the long run, it does not seem far-fetched to suggest that the introduction of printing to Iran in the Qajar period contributed to developments that eventually culminated in the triumph of tradition in the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending the lecture. I also wanted to take a second and say, if it wasn't the help of Dr. Malzov uh, with the exhibition, uh, a lot of the lithographic pieces that are in there, I had to personally consult him for his expertise. And it's uh, noteworthy to say that without his help, I would not have had the full range of information that have, has gone into the exhibit. So um, please uh, ask a few questions. And I will take about three since we're running out of time. But Farman, go ahead. All right, you start first and then I'm, yeah. Okay. Um, as you mentioned, there was more of a fight on the topography, beginning of the uh, 19th century. But I just want to confirm what you said. The reason that um, uh, the topography took over, uh, although Mughal was, was at the time, not 1820, Well, I think uh, I, I mentioned a number of social cultural reasons. Uh, the reasons begin with the availability of the technical equipment you need for printing from movable type. I mean, the essential point is that you need the instruments, the technical equipment, molds for pre preparing new characters all the time because the characters wear out. Uh, it might have been that this was this, the technical knowledge was not available to that point. If it was available, it was still very uh, expensive to run a printing press for a movable type. But this is only one of the reasons. Uh, other reasons are uh, that uh, books printed from movable type in the early period were, let's say, it's, let's put it very simple, were regarded as ugly. Hmm? 
you had, I mean, if you look at some of the books, the characters are not even joined properly, like they would have to be in Arabic writing. Uh, so the technological knowledge to produce uh, typographic books in a, an appeal, uh, an, 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 a shape that was appealing to the audience was simply not there. That's the second reason. Uh, the third reason, of course, goes in favor of lithography because lithography essentially continues manuscript production. I mean, if you want to produce a lithograph book, you write a page like previously you would write a page for a manuscript. The result would look exactly like the previous manuscripts. And we have uh, very many examples for early uh, printed lithograph books that were then even adorned uh, to emulate uh, manuscript production. Like people would uh, add borders in color or they would sprinkle the pages with gold uh, just to make it appear as a manuscript. That's another reason. And we should not forget the writer's guilds, the calligraphers' guilds, who uh, faced the danger of running out of business. I mean, if, you, if, if printing from movable type takes over hundreds, if not thousands of people living from the trade of writing books would have gone out of business. So there was a strong opposition to that from that point. And that all adds up to a bundle of arguments uh, why printing from movable type in the early period was not successful. Well, we, we know uh, when uh, Johannes Gutenberg, uh, as they usually say, invented printing, which he did not, but he invented the molding of letters that could be used for uh, printing from mobile type. When he did that, um, Latin writing in manuscripts was using separate letters. Uh, it was not like handwriting, like joined letters together, as we might uh, uh, see in in modern handwriting, but it was simple, uh, separate letters. And what he did essentially is to, um, to copy these letters and turn them into movable type. The same thing could not be done for Arabic or for that matter, Persian writing, uh, because you need a number of different shapes. You need to posit them very carefully so as to join the letters together. So it is a fairly complicated process. Uh, and it seems that in the early period of the introduction of printing to Iran, people were not able to do that in a proper way. Go ahead, yes. Mike. Thank you very much for your gently provocative uh, talk. I want to uh, <laughs> defend Eisenstein for just a minute. Uh, she called her work as a, printing as an agent of change, not, a print, not printing as an agent, agent of revolution. And one, of, one of the, if there was a revolutionary impact to, to the purpose of the Inconabular period or, or beyond, perhaps the Reformation more than anything else that was revolutionary, revolutionary use of printing. But one of the things that she emphasizes, and it's always, it's always about European printing, and one of the things that's always puzzled me about Eastern printing, especially in the Muslim world, is that in Europe you have, in her view, in her description, a continental spread slow seepage of the invention out of out of Germany and across Northern Europe into the South and the printer mm -hmm. picked it up all over the place. Whereas in the Muslim world, the independent production of printed books in Turkey and Iran and the Arab countries and, and Napoleon and Mutafarika and all these people uh, were, were that kind of independent of one another and there was no bleeding of the invention uh, Across, across cultures, except perhaps Persian printing into the subcontinent. Mm. You could elucidate that for a moment. Well, this, this is an important argument that you're mentioning. Um, I should probably start by saying that I don't think my title, neither my title nor my paper is very provocative. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm being mild on Eisenstein because I think that for the region of the world she covered, she's probably perfectly right. Um, if there's anything to criticize, it's probably, 
points of the reception of Eisenstein by later scholars. Uh, and I think the discussion here moves on, on two different levels. Uh, the, the, the question might be whether, well, the introduction of printing induced change and then modernity, or whether they say the, the air for modernity was not there and printing just came at the right time. If we look at it the second way, we can say that for Iran, this argument would perfectly work. Uh, I mentioned at the very end of my talk uh, the introduction of printing to Iran in, in the Safavid period. Uh, Shah Abbas was perfectly aware of the Armenians printing their books. And if rumors are right, uh, then he was even offered by the Armenians that they could print Persian books for him. He did not. He did, simply did not respond to that offer. So it needed a different intellectual, cultural, uh, societal development uh, for printing to be accepted in Iran. Mm -hmm. And I guess in medieval Europe uh, with Gutenberg and the 15th century developments, intellectual developments uh, above all, the atmosphere was right uh, uh, to respond to that new invention. Mm, the point you're making about a larger cultural sphere is of course very right. Uh, in Europe, everybody printed in Latin characters, though in different writings, well, in different languages, in different languages. But they could use the same technique. They could use essentially the same equipment. Um, in um, the Middle East, I would say it's probably not exactly that separate from each other as one might think. Um, because lithographic printing was known in the Arab world and the Persian world at the same time, uh, well, more or less uh, in the 19th century. In the Arab world, it was not developed very much, uh, again, for a number of specific regions, uh, reasons, uh, reasons specific for Arab culture. Uh, but for instance, I mean, if we look at, um, at the successful introduction of printing from Mughal type to Iran, there's a strong link to Turkey again. Because this travelogue, Nasreddin Shah's travelogue, was first printed in Istanbul, which means with Turkey, Turkish know-how, Turkish equipment, even Turkish fonts for printing. Uh, so the, the, there are a number of, of um, overlaps. Um, and in Iran, I think the uh, region where there is the most of overlap between um, even books printed for the Ottoman market and then the uh, Farsi language uh, Persian market is the region of Azerbaijan, Tabriz. And it is no co coincidence that printing was first introduced to Tabriz, uh, where you had audiences in both languages and books be even being printed for the Ottoman market. Um, I guess this, th these are points that need to be explored in more detail. Uh, and we don't know much about that uh, yet. We don't know, but we can surmise that even some of the people active in printing books in Iran had links to Turkey. Uh, my uh, favorite artist of the period, Mirza Ali Khuli Khui, I mean, he came from Azerbaijan. He came from a Turkish language region, and uh, he most probably also illustrated books in Turkish. And, and then, and then you're, of course, right, there's a great connection, a big connection to the subcontinent, uh, the printing of Persian books in, uh, in uh, India, and not only the printing of books, but also, say, the uh, initial spark for having the idea to print books. I mean, where was Shahnameh first printed? It was not printed in Iran, it was printed in India. Uh, uh, and from there on, people got the idea that it might be a useful idea to print books and distribute them in larger numbers. So thank you for this intervention. Thank you. We don't have more time. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Again, we've had the wonderful Professor Fly from such a far distance. I'm really glad that he took the time and you stayed here for the entire program. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.